when night falls. They come into their own. Astrophotographers portray the night sky in spectacular images. With their cameras, they show celestial phenomena in a way never seen before. On voyages of adventure over five continents. Today, Canada. On his search for the Northern Lights, we follow Yuichi Takasaka through the wintry landscape of the Yukon. My name is Yuichi Takasaka. I was born in Japan, but moved to Canada when I was 20 years old. Yuichi is a photographer who specializes in taking spectacular shots of the night sky. For the moment, it is wild caribou that fill his view as he journeys to the Arctic Ocean to capture a very special phenomenon. I have been shooting Northern Lights, millions of <laughs> images in order to take time-lapse videos. I have been taking Northern Lights since 1990. <laughs> Yuichi begins his photo expedition into the Canadian Arctic in Vancouver, British Columbia. Today, he takes time-lapse shots of the city's skyline, but tomorrow, he will set off into the wilds of northern Canada. It's the end of March, which means two weeks of icy temperatures, as he aims to capture pictures he's been dreaming of since childhood. Japan, we learn about northern lights, which we call aurora. In the schools, we learn there are so many media going about northern lights as well. So everybody in Japan would say, I would like to see northern lights before I die. When I was young, I read a book called Alaskan Story by a Japanese writer, Jiro Nitta. That book describes Northern Lights so vividly. I've never seen Aurora back, back then, of course, and, uh, but to read about that story was very, very special. So I'm going over to Yukon and Northwest Territories. From there on, I can take Ice Road on the Mackenzie River to Taktuyaktak, which is an Inuit community right beside Arctic Ocean on the Beaufort Sea. I would like to go over and get some Northern Light shots. White Horse is pretty warm still, about, about zero degrees. But as you drive up north, of course it gets colder and colder. When it's a strong wind, it can go wind chill factor of minus 50, easy. So I brought my cold gear, a hat to very big jacket, pants, and most importantly, you need the very nice uh, boots.
will fly from Vancouver Airport to Whitehorse. And then I'm going to rent RV, small uh, truck based for by fours, so I can drive all the way up to Arctic Ocean. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Whitehorse Passenger The flight takes us 1,500 kilometers north along Canada's Pacific coast. Whitehorse is the capital of the Yukon Territory in the north of Canada. With fewer than 30,000 inhabitants, it holds the world record for having the cleanest air of any city on the planet. Protected by the walls of the valley, Whitehorse enjoys a milder climate than most other places at this latitude. for a while. Yuichi travels around the globe to get his time-lapse shots of the northern lights. He is often accompanied on his expeditions by like-minded aficionados and amateur photographers. Earlier projects took him to Tasmania and other places too. Scotland. And Norway, to name just three. These colorful celestial phenomena are called the Northern Lights because they are predominantly visible in the far north but they are also visible, though more rarely, in the Southern Hemisphere, where they are called the Aurora Australis. What are you carrying? It's heavy. You got two propane bottles. Mm -hmm. This is for heating and for your, for your fridge and freezer and for cooking. Hook the step up, mm -hmm. pull it out, mm -hmm. right? Ah. And go up and for your balance there's a handle, please okay. go ahead. So again, it's winter. Mm -hmm. Behind this door is your bathroom. It's off limits. You're not going to use it at all. Okay. Yeah. If you have to go, you have yeah. to use the Bosch. Okay. okay the reason why you can't use the water system is because it's winter. Mm -hmm. All the pipes they are filled with antifreeze. Right. As soon you put water right. into the sink, the toilet, or oh, oh, the pipes are going to crack. So open and lock the camper door. So it's going to be this lock. Right. And the teeth go up. So let's close it. And the handle actually you can move up and flip it in. It's your key. Have fun. Have fun. Yuichi will be traveling to increasingly remote regions on his journey, so he needs to stock up on supplies in Whitehorse, including food and water. sets off on the Alaska Highway to Dawson City, the only tarmac section of the 1,400-kilometer journey. When I was young, I liked to listen to our music. The band called Journey came with a music video called Face Flea. They are just going concert to concert on their own uh, big bus. The view was just amazing from uh, tundra to uh, desert. So I thought at that point I knew I'm going to America. At 20, I just flew to Vancouver because that's the closest from Japan. It wasn't America, but I, it was really nice.
halfway to Dawson, the route takes Yuichi past a photographic opportunity he cannot pass up, the Five Finger Rapids. A magnet for landscape photographers, this location was the site of high drama more than a hundred years ago. At the height of the 1898 gold rush, many gold prospectors spent the summer navigating their overloaded dinghies and homemade rafts 1,300 kilometers up the Yukon River. One of the greatest obstacles on this dangerous route was right here, the Five Finger Rapids. Basalt rock formations block the river and split it into various tributaries. But only one of the channels heading north actually leads anywhere. In summer, the others turn into dangerous rapids. Many of the pioneers chose the wrong path and capsized. One of the five columns was later blown up to make the narrow straits more passable. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. After a long journey on a snowy road, Yuichi finally reaches Dawson City. As it starts to thaw and the sky looks like it's clearing up, tonight might see the perfect conditions good for a sighting of the Northern Lights. At Dawson City, the Klondike River flows into the wider Yukon. Though at the moment, everything is still frozen. The region east of the Alaskan border is called Klondike Fields. At the end of the 19th century, pioneers struck gold in a creek near Dawson, prompting a stampede to the area. This was the start of the famous Klondike Gold Rush. Once a quiet border town, it was suddenly brimming with shrewd entrepreneurs, mounted police, burlesque dancers, and desperate gold seekers. Today, Dawson City is an eclectic place, full of remnants of its past and attractions that draw in visitors from all over the world.
the good weather is not holding. By afternoon, thick cloud is gathering in the valley. Unable to take any shots tonight, Yuichi decides to join the infamous Sour Toe Cocktail Club, which has a peculiar initiation ceremony. That's what they call a toe jam. Kept in salt, keeps it completely preserved. Oh, it's a coarse one. Oh, it's black. Oh, it is. It's what they call necrotic. It's completely mummified. Uh. Wow. So how do you get those toes? We get the toes through usually anonymous donations through wills. Oh. But sometimes, like in the case of this one where it was a live person and it was an industrial accident, we can get them that way too. <laughs> so that many people have been doing? 63774? Yes. If you stay from freeze up to break up, then you are a sourdough. Right. Right. But people come up here, tourist operators, miners, they come up in the spring, they leave in the fall, so they, they're not sourdoughs. So he said, in order to be an honorary sourdough, you have to kiss the sour toe. Okay. He started that in 1973. Are you ready, Yuichi? Yes. Here we go. In recognition of Yuichi, in the presence of witnesses, wishes to partake of an authentic sour toe cocktail thereby following in the wayward, even staggering footsteps of Captain Riverat, will prove to be a person capable of almost anything. Almost. And is therefore fully entitled to bear this prestigious certificate, suitable for framing. So, Yuichi, you can drink it fast. You can drink it slow. But your lips must touch this gnarly toe. Just your lips, Yuichi. Okay. All right. Let's launch it. Kapai. Well done, Ichi. So, Yuichi, here is the evidence of your folly. Thank you. And welcome to the club, sir. Thank you. A little to the east of Dawson City, the Dempster Highway begins on its way to Inuvik a town beyond the Arctic Circle in the Northwest Territories. Much of the 740 kilometer long highway follows an old dog sled trail. Highway has been designed to cope with some extreme physical conditions. The two lane road runs through three mountain ranges and sits on a thick bed of gravel that insulates the permafrost in the soil below. Without this gravel cushioning, the permafrost layer would melt and the road would simply sink into the ground. Set in 2,200 square kilometers of rugged mountains and rolling tundra, Tombstone Territorial Park is one of the largest areas of natural conservation in Canada. The park is home to a vast array of wildlife, including moose, caribou, wolves, grizzly bears, and more than 130 species of bird. And it's one of the photographer's favorite spots. There's a good chance he'll get some great time-lapse shots as the weather is looking good. So I chose this uh, Tombstone Territorial Park this time because this is one of my favorite locations in Canada. I've been here so many times in the past. 
mountains are just rugged and really nice. You can see the really nice valley here. People, you know, hike in the summer, cross country ski in the winter. I just be here, take pictures all night and days, and uh, very, very little people come here. Once the intervalometer is set, the camera shoots automatically and patiently, picture after picture. It takes hours before enough shots have been taken for a short time-lapse sequence. You know, it was blue sky earlier, now it's totally clouded and it started to snow. So uh, sometimes it happens like you get like a foot of snow, 30 centimeters overnight. Then the next morning I wake up and like I have to dig out myself. I don't get lonely here because I know that I'm going back to the civilization to my family. I just need my own time sometimes. The Northern Lights, or the Aurora Borealis, to give them their scientific name, come about when charged particles hurled into space by solar eruptions penetrate the Earth's magnetic shield and collide with atoms and molecules in our own atmosphere. These collisions result in countless little bursts of light called photons that form the Northern Lights. Excited oxygen atoms produce red and green light, while nitrogen atoms produce pink and purple. The phenomenon is mainly seen at the Earth's magnetic poles, where our planet's magnetic shield is at its weakest. Thanks to a night of snow and icy temperatures, Yuichi was unable to photograph the northern lights over Tombstone Park. Now he must start the engine and let it warm up before continuing on his travels. But overnight, the engine has given up the ghost. Okay. The extreme cold seems to have run down the car battery. Yuichi will have to jump start the engine. Luckily, he's brought a portable power pack for just such an occasion.
Yuichi continues his journey north on the Dempster Highway. No sign of human life as far as the eye can see. No side roads, no houses, no power lines. The land is vast, with the horizon stretching for thousands of kilometers in every direction. Dempster Highway, basically no more than a narrow, untarmacked track, is the only path through this immense backcountry with its breathtaking wilderness. Yuichi fills his tank again at Eagle Plains Lodge, the last rest stop before the Arctic Circle. Despite the flurry of snow, he sets up his camera on the side of the road. Tonight, luck is on his side. The sky clears, and Yuichi gets his first real time-lapse shot. Light-sensitive digital cameras with long exposure times make the northern lights even lighter and more beautiful than when seen with the naked eye. In the time-lapse sequences, the accelerated paths of satellites and aeroplanes can sometimes be made out. Back on Dempster Highway, Yuichi officially enters the Arctic Circle. It was along this route that a terrible tragedy once struck. In 1911, four Canadian Mounties froze to death and are forever remembered as the Lost Patrol. Traveling from Fort McPherson to Dawson City, they were surprised by snowstorms that caused them to wander off the path and into the snowy landscape. The men had hired a local man called Isao George as their guide, but tragically had sent him home early. Without Isao's intimate local knowledge, the men lost their way and met their end. The traditional knowledge needed to survive in this unforgiving and harsh environment was handed down to Esau over thousands of years and through many generations. Today, many of the indigenous cultures in the Canadian Arctic have lost that precious wisdom. Robert Alexi is a Dini elder and a resident of Fort McPherson who laments this loss. Well, I remember from back in, in early 40s, you know, in the summertime, there's in winter time, there's nobody in McPherson. Everybody's out struggling, making their own living. No government, nothing, you know, making their own living off the land, summer and winter, until the f in 50s, government started coming in and giving a ration, they call, what the hell they call that, a income support. Now they call it income support. And then government start coming in and giving, here, you give your house, stay in it, you new house, you don't have to pay. That spoil everything. And then you can't go out of school, you can't go out of town because your kids can't go to school. That make it worse. And then no job, them kids are brought up in the buildings, you know. And they don't know nothing. 
They go to school, but they don't know if they're going to land. They don't know nothing. That's what happened. I drove up today again to very close to Fort McPherson. Now I'm in the Northwest Territories side, across the border from Yukon. And uh, I'm now on uh, Peel River. It's frozen, so it, we are on the ice. It's called the ice bridge. So I will try somewhere from here. I'm just gonna find some good spot and then I uh, think we are gonna get something. The trip through the snow and ice takes us 180 kilometers away to Inuvik. We continue east until we reach the Mackenzie River. Then Dempster Highway bends northwards. Now in early April, the many lakes and waterways in this region still lie under a heavy layer of snow. Only in May will the ice melt. Inuvik is the last stop on the Dempster Highway. It is populated primarily by indigenous groups with a few non-native residents as well. The Igloo Church located in the center of town is considered Inuvik's most iconic landmark. Tonight, Yuichi hopes to create an urban Northern Lights time-lapse with the Igloo Church in the foreground. However, thick clouds are again foiling his plans. Since time immemorial, humans in the northern polar region have been fascinated by the northern lights. In Inuit culture, numerous myths surround this phenomenon. Some see in them ghosts of their dead or the souls of fallen warriors, while others see the lights as a warning of coming danger. Yuichi has arranged to meet Lillian Elias, one of the Inuit elders, to talk about the role of the Northern Lights in traditional mythology. Yeah, so uh, do you have any uh, story from your ancestry? When I was growing up, Northern Lights met, meant a lot to me. Mm. Before I moved to Inuvik, mm -hmm. 13 years, I was only 13 years old when I moved to Inuvik, and Northern Lights got less and less because we stayed no. inside the night uh -huh. mm. because of that we have uh, a lot of TV and everything. Northern life n didn't mean as much as they did mm -hmm. when I was younger. Right. Because I was out every night mm -hmm. watching Northern yeah. Life and our, our ancestors, my grandparents, my parents would tell us that if we whistle, really loud, mm -hmm. the northern lights are going to come down. They're mm -hmm. going to come down and oh. cut your neck right off and oh, wow. see your head rolling. Oh, that's yeah. the first story. <laughs> that's where they taught us how it's so important to respect everything that there is on the, on the earth right. and oh, in wow. the skies. The colors that you see mm -hmm. on the northern lights are meaningful. Oh. 
there's power there, yes. and there's uh, uh, processions that you could own, mm -hmm. and all the different colors oh, that I there see. is there. What's the red? Mm. Red is uh, power. Power? Yes. Ah. Power to all mm. the about universe. The green? Green is uh, some growing, the mm. green, like whatever grows on the land. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's what ah. makes it grow. What else, the color do you have, like uh, purple? Yellow. yellow. Yellow is for bright. Bright. For, ah. for making the whole earth mm. be daylight, right. because we have a lot of 24 hour ah, nights, huh? right. we yes. have dark days. Mm. On his way from Inuvik further north, Yuichi is treated to an impressive spectacle. To mark the start of spring each year, a herd of more than 3,000 reindeer are driven across the frozen Mackenzie River ice road between the communities of Inuvik and Taktayaktak. Their migration will take them to a small island in the Canadian Arctic that will serve as their calving grounds. This tradition first began in 1935, when Sami herders and Alaska natives brought a herd of reindeer, originally from Russia, to the Mackenzie Delta. The Canadian government then decided to establish farm-raised reindeer in the region to revitalize the dwindling stock of wild reindeer that traditionally provided food and fur for the locals. Today it's really cold. It's, uh, it's been minus 20 and the wind is blowing. So wind chill factor is about minus 40 or even colder. So, you know, any exposed area of the skin can freeze like within one minute. So you have to really be careful. The chain tying down the camper from a truck broke off somewhere. It was lucky that happened in a village that I can get the parts. Ah, it's too loose. This ice road is made by uh, government of Northwest Territories Highway. Early season, they started to uh, remove the snow, so it really gets really flat, and uh, it, it cools down really quickly because uh, snow uh, insulates. So they remove it, and then uh, ice gets thicker and thicker. So it's much nicer and then flat. But uh, some uh, places, like uh, there's a current underneath, this is already uh, Mackenzie River. So when the uh, current is fast, you know, ice becomes thinner. End of the season in the spring, you shouldn't be uh, wearing a seat belt. They just, you know, just for precaution.
In his camper van, Yuichi follows the reindeer's route over the ice. The Mackenzie River, also called the Amazon of the North, flows from Great Slave Lake northwards out into the Beaufort Sea. For much of the year, the towns around the river delta are only accessible by air or boat. But once the river freezes over, travelers driving north from Inuvik take the roughly 180 kilometer long Mackenzie River Ice Road. On the slippery surface of the river, you have to drive carefully. Now in the spring, the ice is already thinning and drivers are advised not to wear a safety belt, just in case. However, the ice road might soon become a thing of the past as a proper road to Takta Yaktak is now under construction. The last leg of the journey ends at the Arctic Ocean, at the northern tip of the North American continent. The town of Taktayaktak is just called Tuk by most people. Located north of the Arctic Circle, the town has barely 850 residents. The Beaufort Sea is frozen over for most of the year. Known for many years as Port Brabant, the town was renamed in 1950, becoming the first place in Canada to revert to its original indigenous name. It's 11.05 at night, but still this light, that is the whole uh, Beaufort Sea, which is a part of Arctic Ocean. This is where I wanted to film the Northern Lights for many, many years. And I didn't know the forecast was for snow tonight, but it just happened like this. So I have to wait probably another hour before uh, Northern Lights will Appear, but it's clear. I may get some really nice aurora tonight. Although the weather is good and some northern lights do appear, the activity is not quite as dramatic as Yuichi had hoped. The next morning, the photographer visits the local elementary school to talk to students about his work. This is the yellow knife. The, uh, the color red is on top and then green is on the bottom, right? So, uh, because uh, the uh, nitrogen, whoa, this was a big blow up. Have you seen something like that? Have you heard any uh, mythology or your uh, grandpa, grandma says, you know, you don't go outside or something when the lights are out? Do you know any stories? 
If you listen, if your mother might say that you think being cursed or something. Uh, capture you? Oh. So do you whistle? Do you know anyone who's actually captured by Northern Lights? No? In all the years Yuichi has been photographing the Northern Lights, he has never tried whistling at them. Tonight is Yuichi's last night in Tak, and his last chance to capture the image he imagined as a child. The northern lights suspended over the frozen Arctic Ocean. The celestial phenomenon is so strong tonight that the aurora is even visible with the naked eye. And luck is on his side. It stops snowing and the clouds lift. cloudy all day, a little bit of snow, and uh, I was hoping and hoping didn't happen, but just after uh, midnight, it started to thin. Clouds are just uh, disappearing, and one o'clock, entire sky was filled with northern lights. This is amazing, just, just all over the place right now. Everybody, you know, interpret really differently, but actually you're seeing the same stars. The sky's just one here on the earth. So everybody is under the sky. So borderless sky. You know, it's great for maybe a peace. Now, at the end of the trip, Yuichi cannot help but challenge the northern lights. And what do you know? Apparently, they aren't as mean and nasty as some think. Yuichi Takasaka's childhood dream of one day seeing the northern lights over the Arctic Ocean has come true. Now, right at the end of his adventure, he finally gets the time-lapse shots he's been wanting for so long. <laughs> 